Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to the Green Bank 101 panel discussion. My name is Carolina Herrera. I'm manager for Latin America Green Finance and Climate Change at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And I'm one of the organizers of the Green, Green Bank Design Summit. We have some wonderful speakers today, but before we start, I'll go over a few logistical reminders. This session has live translation to Spanish. You can select the Spanish channel by clicking the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. You can also mute the floor audio if you prefer. If you have questions or technical issues, you can click on the orange question mark on the bottom left of the Social 27 screen, or you can direct message to anyone who has a background like mine. Today's session will provide an overview of Green Bank models and the roles these institutions or specialized facilities play in the market as well as some of the potential pathways for their establishment. We know there's growing interest around the world in the Green Bank model, but that efforts to establish Green Banks often face multiple barriers. So the session also aims to provide insights from the journeys and experiences of some existing Green Banks. We will first start with a presentation from Andrea Colmes, Director for Global Green Bank Development at the Coalition for Green Capital, who will go over the fundamentals of Green Banks. After that, Mary Templeton, Executive Director of Michigan Saves, will moderate a panel discussion with Andrea Mohamed Sayed, a specialist in the climate finance unit the también en la unidad de finanzas con el desarrollo en el sur de África. President and CEO of the Connecticut Green Bank. If you have questions for the panelists, please put them in the Q&A box and we will do our best to get to them at the end. And with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Andrea so she can begin her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. And as soon as Daisy opens the slides and shares that, I can begin. Great. And there, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm delighted to be here today and I'm very happy to again participate in the Green Bank Design Summit and I'll look forward to it being in person again, perhaps next year or the year after. Um, I'm going to provide a brief grounding in the Green Bank model and certainly look towards more discussion and questions as is useful to participants. Um, I'm going to be brief to respect the amount of time that we have together and very much look forward to the conversation with our other speakers. So to start, it's always important to remind ourselves why we need to add to the climate finance infrastructure overall. And um, more recently than the data in this slide, the International Energy Agency is currently estimating that within around, um, by the end of the decade, annual capital spending on clean energy, not even the entire climate equation, is going to have to expand more than about seven times to be around US dollars, um, one trillion per year to meet our climate and related green investment objectives. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So given that rising investment need and an investment threshold that is higher than what the current structure can provide, green banks are trying to solve the problem of filling in gaps in public funding by more effectively crowding in private investment into the market and to use public funding as a catalyst to reduce risk and to enable that flow of private capital. The idea behind green banks is to address constraints in the marketplace that currently limit or constrict the flow of private capital into green and climate related projects. And to do that by offering specialized investment products, investment strategies, as well as taking on sort of the role of first mover and demonstration role in the marketplace to demonstrate a mix of new technologies, the viability of investments, and to reduce the perception of risk alongside reducing actual risk through specialized financial interventions. And green banks generally use a blended finance approach, blending public capital with private capital, and we'll turn more to that in the slides ahead. The next slide, please. 
The Green Bank model can take different forms in different countries. Typically, it's formed either at a national level or subnational at a state or sometimes at a city level. Um, in all cases, though, green banks are unified by having a clear mandate to increase green investment through crowding in private capital, to mobilize uh, private capital through using innovative financial products. They provide dedicated expertise into the green investment space to complement what exists or needs to grow through existing financial institutions. And ultimately, they are designed to be self-sustaining financial institutions over time so that once they get through a launch phase, they are able to recycle capital and generate sufficient revenues to cover operating expenses and therefore be able to be continuous over time. The next slide, please. So here's a broad schematic of how a green bank can be functioned. And while they can be different and almost always are different structurally according to the needs and circumstances in each country based on the existing host institutions as well as um, the nature of capital, there are several sort of core aspects that um, remain relatively constant. And the first thing to note is that green banks can be structured either as a part of an existing facility, a new division of or a new component of an existing facility, or they can be standalone newly created institutions. In developing countries, it is much more often the case that green banks will be created as part of an existing host institution for various reasons, including uh, logistics, um, credibility, the ability to land capital um, is often connected to being part of an existing institution versus a new greenfield institution. So that's just something to keep in mind that we have all learned through our early stage efforts to create green banks in various countries. So the top line here shows these are sources of capital that can be used to uh, public capital that can be used to capitalize the green bank and they can come from appropriations through a national, uh, a national um, uh, structure in some way. They can come from donor institutions, development finance institutions, which is quite often the case. They can come from green climate funds. The green climate fund itself um, is very interested in the green bank model and often provides um, a very promising source of capital that fits with the blended needs of the facility. Private capital can also come in at the fund level if the risk structure is such um, that works for private capital um, partners. These various sorts of capital are blended into the finance facility and then used through an array of different financial products or strategies to co-finance at the project level with commercial investors. And these projects can be funded um, in a number of different ways but the key is that they will be co-financing and enabling the engagement of commercial investors. So that's the flow from public capital through the facility, out through specifically market fit design products to then work with commercial investors at the project level. The next slide, please. Um, green banks can be created in a number of ways, as I mentioned. In developing countries, they are much more often likely to be created through partnering with existing institutions. And um, in that case, their specific structure, the structure of um, both governance and the flow of funds will be specific to that country and to that institution. Um, they can in many cases also be formed by legislation, which is certainly the case with the original UK Green Investment Bank, the um, Clean Energy Finance Corporation in Australia, the New York Green Bank, the Connecticut Green Bank that we're going to hear from. Um, so there are a range of options ranging from independent to working with an existing institution. The next slide, please. Capitalization for green banks is a critical element, um, both in terms of the need for public funds to sit within the blended finance stack and reduce risk, and in addition, the nature of the capital in, a green, in the green bank has to be consistent with the mission of the green bank and can also ensure that that mission is executed due to the requirements of the capital sources. 
in the public appropriations category in developing countries. Um, capitalization, as I mentioned, can come from development finance institution, donor entities, and development partners. And it can also come from climate funds. Um, and those funds often flow through in a way that requires participation through sovereign debt as well. So those are the more common public sources of capitalization in developing countries. Um, green bonds also present a really interesting future option for green bank capitalization that has not yet been put on the ground, but um, mobilizing green bonds in a leveraged structure through green banks can amplify their effect in the market. And then it is also possible to have philanthropic or impact investors at the fund level or at the project level. Um, and uh, that's something also to keep in mind. The next slide, please. Um, I think I've mostly um, touched on this in a very brief way that green banks can be structured either um, independently or part of a public um, and existing partnership. In general, green banks who are more commonly structured in terms of public ownership. Um, some of the examples to that include those I have mentioned. Um, and in addition, we'll be hearing from the DBSA today. That's another example of a publicly owned green bank. Um, it's also the model being used for a new green bank that is under development in Rwanda. Um, it's what is envisioned through um, a pending um, project in Uganda. Um, and in uh, other countries as well. Green banks can also be privately owned um, and Tata Clean Tech in India presents an example of that. Um, there's also a nonprofit model, NICE in New York State and a branch of the Connecticut Green Bank Inclusive Prosperity Capital, which Brian can of course speak to. But just to keep in mind that there are different models for ownership across the public to private spectrum. Is there another slide? No, I'm done. So thank you. And I'll hand it forward now to Mary. Thank you, Andy. That was a great overview of um, some of the logistics and the structures of green banks. I'm Mary Templeton. I am the president and CEO of Michigan Saves. We are one of the examples of a nonprofit green bank located in the state of Michigan in the United States. Um, I am so delighted to be here to moderate a panel of experts. Um, Andy gave a very nice overview. Now we're going to dig into the details of a couple of green banks, and then Andy will come on as well to give some insights um, that everyone can um, benefit from. So the way that this panel is structured is that Brian and Mohammed and Andy will each spend a few minutes grounding you in each of their organizations, Brian and Mohammed in particular. And then Andy will give some examples of some challenges that green banks may face and some approaches to consider in overcoming those challenges. After each one of the panelists present, then we'll, um, I will moderate a discussion and uh, question and answer session. And so as you hear the panelists speak or as the questions start to be uncovered, feel free to um, participate by asking your question in the Q&A section. Um, so with that, Brian, why don't I turn it directly over to you? Great. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction, Mary. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, the Connecticut Green Bank is the first uh, government, state government backed green bank in the United States. Uh, my colleague, Mary Templeton, uh, leading Michigan Saves, is the first nonprofit green bank here in the United States. Uh, together, uh, we work closely uh, through the American Green Bank Consortium to help other local and state green banks advance the green bank model. So it's great to be here with Mary uh, and Muhammad uh, and Andy to talk about green banks with you uh, today at the Design Summit. Um, our mission, uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Our mission at the Connecticut Green Bank 
is to confront climate change. Um, so whether that is uh, the three legs of the Paris Agreement, mitigation, adaptation, and increasing capital flows, our focus is to confront climate change. And we do that by increasing and accelerating the flow of private capital into markets that energize the green economy. I'll talk a little bit about some of the tools that we use, but you will be learning over the course of the next day or so, some of those tools for how to implement the green bank model. Everyone's journey to creating a green bank is different. Um, and it's different because of your geography, you know, your access to renewable energy differs. Uh, it's different because of the political situations that your local and national and regional governments pursue. Uh, and it's different because of the overall market context in terms of how you operate. Uh, in Connecticut, we were actually formed uh, based on a failed federal US government policy called the American Clean Energy and Securities Act in 2009. Uh, it did not pass Congress. Uh, the advocates for that bill then took the concept to the state of Connecticut, uh, working with the governor and the legislature, passed a bipartisan bill that effectively created the Connecticut Green Bank in July of 2011. So we are uh, a little more than a week away from our 10-year anniversary as the U.S.'s first state-level green bank. We focus on financing clean energy. Uh, that is commercially available clean energy technologies. We do not uh, invest in early stage new technologies or entrepreneurs. We focus on commercially available technologies. Um, our focus, as I mentioned, is to enable more private capital to flow into the green economy of Connecticut. And what we do is we provide end use customers, families and businesses with easy and affordable access to capital to finance clean energy improvements on their property. Our stakeholders, our customers, contractors, and capital providers, as well as policymakers. Over the last 10 years, we've had a significant impact on green, the green economy of Connecticut, including using $300 million of public resources to mobilize $1.7 billion of private investment in our green economy, to create over 23,000 jobs, reduce the energy burden, that is the energy costs on our families and businesses, over 55,000 of them, and avoiding nearly 9 million metric tons of CO2 emissions over the life of those projects. Uh, we were recognized by Harvard University in 2017 with the Innovation in American Government Awards for sparking the Green Bank movement in the United States of America. Uh, and our journey continues. Uh, just recently, uh, we've had a bipartisan passage uh, of an expansion of the Connecticut Green Bank's mission beyond clean energy mitigation to include environmental infrastructure, adaptation, and resiliency. Let's go to the next slide. So what are we? The Connecticut Green Bank uh, is a quasi-public. Uh, that is to say that we are a corporation of the state of Connecticut. You could think of us that way. We have to operate at the speed of business. So we use private sector disciplines to achieve public sector goals. Our focus is not financial profit. Our focus is social and environmental profit by engaging more private capital investment in our green economy. Uh, we focus on ensuring that the public policy objectives of the state are attracting and mobilizing private investment into our economy, whether that is a renewable portfolio standard, which we have a 40% by 2030 target, uh, or a greenhouse gas emission reduction target. Uh, we've got an 80% reduction by 2050 uh, based on 2001 levels in terms of our greenhouse gas target. So those are some high level overarching public policies that we are enabling more private capital to flow to help the state achieve those targets. Uh, we receive $30 million in public resources, uh, the Clean Energy Fund, which occurred as a result of electric deregulation in the late 1990s, 
And we also re receive greenhouse gas emission allowance proceeds through something called REGI. Our goal is to turn that $30 million of public revenues into multiples of private investment uh, in our state, five to 10 times multiple of that investment. Uh, our aim is to support projects that mitigate, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as well as adapt to the impacts of climate change. So when you think of clean energy, we focus on renewable energy, energy efficiency. Uh, in Connecticut, we manufacture fuel cells. So fuel cells is considered a clean energy resource. And more recently, as our scope has expanded to include environmental infrastructure, we could now invest in agriculture, water, waste and recycling, resiliency, and other environmental markets. You'll, you're gonna learn over the course of the next day or so, uh, additional tools in terms of how the Green Bank model is applied, but you should always think about this main objective, which is how are you going to use a limited amount of public resources to attract and mobilize multiples of private investment in your green economy. That is a foundation to green banks. For example, in Connecticut, uh, we provide a credit enhancement to our local community banks and credit unions, a second loan loss reserve that we learned from our colleagues in Michigan that effectively teaches our local uh, banking institutions how to invest in and finance clean energy projects for families effectively helping the state implement its clean energy and climate change policies. Those local financial institutions have loaned more than $75 million to families, and the Green Bank has had to pay only $75,000 worth of losses. So there's a big leverage ratio. What we've effectively done here is informed and educated our local community banks and credit unions about our policy, and now we have them investing their resources to support those policies by financing projects for Connecticut families. We also co-invest. Uh, we provide subordinated debt in capital structures alongside senior lenders, uh, our local banks, again, regional state banks, who are interested in financing projects like hydropower, run of the river hydropower, uh, wind projects, food waste to energy projects, by us taking a subordinated loan position, we effectively take the first loss, which encourages the private sector to want to invest and support those projects. Our objective, the second objective, is to make capital accessible and affordable to customers so that the contractors can work to install the projects and deliver those benefits to the customer and all the benefits we like to see uh, happening in our society. We also have the ability to issue bonds to raise additional revenues, which I'd be happy to talk about later. But why don't we transition now to my colleague, uh, Muhammad Syed of the DBSA to tell us what's happening in South Africa. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, and thank you once again to the organizers for inviting the DBSA just to share uh, some thoughts and some lessons around our approach to uh, adopting this uh, Green Bank model. So I think uh, if you look at the, the first slide, um, our journey as DBSA is quite interesting, you know, being a developmental finance institution, uh, focusing on infrastructure finance, wholly owned by the South African government. Um, you know, we obviously very much guided by government policy. Nonetheless, you know, we have a ambition to green our portfolio and ultimately be a green bank. And what it means is that, you know, for us, it will have to be a journey, a transition towards, uh, you know, to, towards, towards this objective. And uh, we explored the Green Bank model and, and tried to find a way of adapting it, you know, to our context, not, not only um, in a South African context or Southern African context, but also in terms of our context as a, as a government owned DFI. And I think what, what made sense for us was to look at a dedicated climate finance facility focusing on climate mitigation and adaptation um, impact projects across all the DBSA mandated sectors and embedding that facility within the bank or incubating it within the bank. And this approach kind of made sense to us as opposed to, let's say, um, setting up a standalone green bank um, for two reasons. I think the first, and I think um, Andy highlighted uh, you know, some of the reasons why banks would want to use that approach. 
for DBSA, the, the, the obvious one was, of course, you know, the back office support already existed. Uh, you know, we can take advantage of that. We can also rely on our sector expertise. We have a lot of sector specialists across different sectors, whether it's renewable energy, um, transport, uh, water, et cetera. And these are all areas where you can demonstrate significant uh, climate mitigation or adaptation impact. The other reason, and I think what is quite key, is that by embedding a dedicated facility within, a, within an existing institution, you are able to perhaps influence the, the mainstream operations of the bank. And um, for us, you know, that's been something we've already observed since we've implemented you know, the climate finance facility. But in terms of establishing this facility, that in itself you know, was quite a journey. And um, uh, you know, we in fact started, uh, you know, it didn't happen overnight. We started uh, managing a, a small green fund in South Africa back in 2012 which allowed us to then seek accreditation with the Green Climate Fund in 2016. And I think that accreditation was the stepping stone for us to explore um, you know, this model of using blended finance to establish a dedicated uh, climate fi finance facility to crowd in private sector to support um, obviously climate mitigation and adaptation projects. So after the accreditation, together with the, you know, um, our collaboration with the Coalition for Green Capital, we put together a proposal to the Green Climate Fund and they agreed to capitalize the, the Climate Finance Facility or the CFF in 2018. Uh, coincidentally, um, during that time, um, the board of the DBSA approved uh, the, a, a climate change policy framework for the bank, where we then identified specific targets with respect to mitigation and adaptation targets um, uh, in terms of what we hope to achieve as part of our portfolio. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so if you look at you know, what these, the, this facility sets out to do, and I think Andy and, and Brian kind of highlighted you know, the role of green, of green banks, and for us, we wanted to, to, um, to use this facility to crowd in private sector and offer products which, which will allow us to do that. So essentially this facility, it's a debt facility aimed at, um, you know, which is co-funded by the Green Climate Fund as well as the DBSA. So the Green Climate Fund committed uh, 55 million USD as well as um, providing a small grant just to help establish uh, you know, this facility within, within the DBSA. Uh, the fund operates in all czar dominated countries in Southern Africa. So it's South Africa, Iswatini, Lesotho, the Kingdom of Lesotho, um, as well as Namibia. And um, as I mentioned before, the main rationale for setting up the CFF is, you know, to crowd in private sector and, and of course, allow this facility to demonstrate um, the benefits of funding climate sector, which, uh, sorry, climate projects which uh, commercial banks in South, in South Africa and, and in Southern Africa still deem to be a bit risky. You know, this is a new area for us, um, for this region. And, you know, it's new technologies. So we needed to find de-risking mechanisms to obviously bring commercial funding on board. And the way we do this through the CFF is to provide credit enhancement and, um, you know, different types of credit enhancement, similar to what I think Brian mentioned, um, you know, uh, with, with the Green Bank in, in, in Connecticut. So we offer subordinated debt, um, first loss, and the funding from the Green Climate Fund allowed us to offer that particular product coupled with um, tenor extension, you know, providing long tenor loans. Commercial banks in particular find tenor extension to be quite attractive because of Basel regulations, you know, they're, una they're unable to lend beyond seven years. And considering that uh, renewable energy projects, you know, have power purchase agreements which span, you know, up to 15 or in fact uh, 20 years in certain cases, you know, that um, credit enhancement, you know, is quite useful. So the CFF would not fund 100% of a project cost. You know, we'd only fund up to 30%, um, and we would look at uh, ultimately a leverage ratio of one is to five with the expectation uh, that um, the balance of the funding would be in the form of senior debt from, from commercial banks. And the concessionality that the Green Climate Fund provides, you know, and which we blend with DBSA resources, we're able to provide you know, quite a competitive rate, which will benefit, obviously, the project sponsors, um, because ultimately that concessionality must pass on to, you know, to the end user. Um, if you could just move on to the last slide, please. 
Um, the last slide just shows you, you know, the fact that, you know, um, this facility is, of course, you know, housed under the DBSA. We use existing resources. I already mentioned, you know, uh, credit processes, back office um, support, as well as, um, you know, the sector specialists that we have. We obviously added additional layers and maybe at a later stage, I'll discuss, you know, how this facility perhaps um, is a bit different from what we normally do as a bank. But I think in terms, if I could just end off, in terms of the key successes to date, bearing in mind we've only started implementing this over the last year and a half, we've already seen tremendous interest in terms of um, adopting this particular model in the region. So there's a lot of interest from national development banks, particularly in the Southern African region to replicate this model. Uh, we've obviously seen interest in the facility itself. So project sponsors are very much interested in accessing the facilities. Commercial banks have approached us. And to date, we've supported, you know, at least two projects or approved two projects. Um, you know, one looking at um, rolling out solar PV across retail centers in, in South Africa. We've got another project looking at so green social housing. I think the key point to mention here is that um, we try to align the focus of the climate finance facility to the DBSA mandated sectors. So we would only look at sectors that we allow to, 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 to focus on. There might be some deviations. So we would look on the climate mitigation side, for example, renewable energy, energy efficiency projects, uh, clean transport. Adaptation side, um, we've only rest we've restricted ourselves to the water sector. So we would look at water efficiency initiatives, provided that you know, the climate rationale is, is quite robust. And lastly, and, and certainly but not least, I think a key success so far is the fact that we're already seeing evidence of this facility influencing the mainstream operations. So bearing in mind that this particular facility is co-funded by the Green Climate Fund, there are very strict reporting mechanisms, especially around verification of the climate impact. And we envisage you know, um, achieving up to 30 million tons of, of CO2 reduce um, to, uh, through the lifespan of this program. Um, you know, so climate indicators are quite key. Gender mainstreaming is quite key. And having um, this facility embedded allowed us to start changing the way we look at infrastructure finance. So um, projects which may not have been conceptualized with a climate focus in mind, are now being assessed you know, with, uh, with a climate lens. And we started ad uh, adopting climate indicators as part of our normal kind of reporting framework. So I think that's a fantastic um, uh, evidence to show that this facility is slowly starting to, to change the way we operate as, as a bank and moving towards um, you know, a, a greener bank um, as, as DBSA. Um, lastly, just in terms of challenges, I think, you know, the key challenge for us um, so far, you know, has been more the issue around, you know, the size of the projects, you know, it's obviously a small facility compared to what we typically do as a bank. So, but we have to start off somewhere. So as the first phase of the CFF, you know, we're looking at projects which may not be as huge as what we typically fund as DBSA. There are obviously teething issues that you face when it comes to um, testing out new financing mechanisms. So one issue we are trying to uh, address is around the fact that as a South African-owned entity, we can only lend in local currency to South African-based institutions, for example, if the, if the projects are based in, in, in ZAR-dominated countries. And we receive funding in, in USD. So there has to be a hedging mechanism. And I think the, the hedging mechanism, uh, you know, that we envisage we would use, you know, has been a bit, um, you know, more complex than we anticipated. But um, that's something we're planning to, to kind of, you know, work on, on, on um, a, a optimal mechanism that would work for both for the Green Climate Fund, as well as the DBSA. So I think these are just normal teething issues that any new facility would, would be facing. But other than that, you know, we haven't come across any major issues so far. It's still early days, but so far, you know, the evidence suggests that this model and approach in terms of um, looking at a dedicated facility within an existing institution seem to be quite relevant. And it may not work for everybody, but certainly in our context, um, it seems like um, it was the way to go. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mohammed, and I think I'll just pick up from here. Um, 
So again, it's a pleasure to be here and I uh, neglected to introduce where I sit. Um, the Coalition for Green Capital is a nonprofit organization that works to support, form, structure, capitalize green banks around the world. And as Mohammed mentioned, we were delighted to work with and support the DBSA in that endeavor. Um, so I think I'm gonna complement what Mohammed and Brian and Mary have shared in terms of green bank function with some of the key elements that CGC has come to understand around the process involved in creating them. And then I'll offer an example of a sort of larger scale systemic initiative complementing the idea of an individual green bank to thinking about how to create them across a number of countries in a region. In this case, the example I'll offer is Africa. So the key steps and challenges for forming green banks are noted here. And I'm just gonna walk through some of the highlights. Um, the first, identifying and engaging the right host institution and the right political champions cannot be overemphasized, it cannot. Oft times there's really um, well-intentioned, sophisticated interest in forming a new catalytic finance facility on the green bank model. But unless the championship is there within the host government and within a credible well-placed host institution, a lot of energy can run in circles instead of towards a productive outcome. And what we've learned is that again, in terms of the host institution, <clears throat> Well, it's tempting in many ways to form a new green bank as a purpose built, newly created entity because you really get control over the, the mandate and mission. It often simply isn't possible to do that. In a more uh, obvious way, capacity issues often step up, um, but more importantly, capital has a really hard time landing at a newly created institution. Capital sources often require an existing balance sheet, a track record um, and um, or at least an existing management team. And it's almost impossible to put those things together in a proactive way for a newly created institution. So technically speaking, capital flows are often restricted to existing institutions and um, consequently combined with the, uh, the capacity issues that countries can face it seems to be advantageous to create green banks through existing institutions unless and if there's a special circumstance that allows them to be created as independent entities. Secondly, it's really important that green banks align with national goals and targets. Um, there's often a broad basis of climate plans and related national policy and planning objectives for the combination of climate through the NDCs as well as sustainable development sectors. And this is intimately connected to um, the third point, which is defining um, a compelling project pipeline in and around market gaps in priority sectors is really the basis of green bank formation. Everything comes back to pipeline and everything comes back to priority sectors. What are the sectors of the green space, be it climate or sustainably uh, sustainable development related projects? where that are really important for a country to meet its climate goals and face specific market gaps that can be addressed. So for projects that are um, commercially viable, but not yet bankable, but for certain credit enhancements, identifying that pipeline and those sectors is really critical to underpin both the operation and the capitalization of the green bank. So any green bank formation process needs to start with an analysis of the market and understand where the specific value add is for the Green Bank. And as Mohammed mentioned, for example, in South Africa, it was more on the commercial and industrially scaled clean energy, clean water, other related green investment, more than at the utility level because of the existing structure and capacity within South Africa or the four Southern African countries that were covered by the CFF. Um, based on that identification of pipeline and priority sectors, 
the um, formation process then moves to really understanding what are the specific financial interventions, the credit enhancements, the financial products that would free that those market segments up and deliver a robust pipeline into the green bank to enable project and deal flow. That's really the foundational work. And then um, the structure related to that, where the green bank sits, what its actual structure is, its business plan, its plan for covering expenses and moving towards self-sustainability, that all then follows. And then related to all of this is the other key issue. I'm in box number six now, if you're following this at all, which is the capitalization of a green bank. The capital sources have to match the mission of the green bank. They have to be aligned with the project pipeline and priority sectors. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they can come from a range of public and private sources. More often in the developing world, they are coming from public sources um, due to perceptions of risk at the fund level, but that need not be the case. Actually in Southern Africa with the DDSA, we worked quite closely with a private source of capital. And I think had we understood some things by the end that, that we understood by the end at the, at the design stage, we might have been able to secure private capitalization as well. It was a learning process. And an important note about capitalization for green banks, often capital flowing into green banks in developing countries flows through the Ministry of Finance and the government in a certain, in, in, a, in various ways that requires um, sovereign debt. So where sovereign debt constraints are present, it's really critical to look at those issues at the front end and design both your sources and balance of capitalization in a way that works with sovereign debt constraints. So those don't end up getting in your way down the line. And then once designed and structured and capitalized, the Green Bank moves into, into action. And it takes some time to launch those first deals in New Zealand. Um, for example, it took a bit more than a year to put the first deals on the ground, which is completely normal. It's a whole new operation. There has to be market interaction, communication with project developers, communication with co-financiers. Um, it's a process to get from design and capitalization into launch and actually um, securing project flow. And then of course, monitoring and reporting and verification across all of the goals of the Green Bank in terms of you know, environmental social safeguards, in terms of gender output, gender objectives, in terms of climate objectives is critical both for the operation of the institution as well as for the funding sources that are flowing into the Green Bank in the first place. So I'll move to the next slide, thanks. So I'm offering here uh, what I'm sort of calling a systemic example. It's one of Green Bank creation. Um, it's one route to create Green Banks country by country, which ultimately really is the heart of the model in that it's market fit, country owned and cut country driven green and climate finance. It is also, um, we're, we're you know, in a very urgent time sensitive climate world. So we're also thinking about ways to support more systemic creation of these climate finance facilities by sharing capacity, sharing knowledge, perhaps sharing capitalization efforts. And as Mohammed mentioned in Southern African region, pulling off of the example of the climate finance facility at the DBSA, there's increasing interest from a number of countries. The same is true across the continent. Um, the African Development Bank in Cote d'Ivoire is working very, uh, very significantly in this space, trying to explore and uncover the potential for green bank formation. So two leading development banks on the African continent are both interested in broader application of the model. And that really points to the potential for doing something in a way that supports action across countries simultaneously versus simply individually. So this is an example of how that might work using the AFTB interest as an example. And before I move to the top of the chart, the two boxes in the middle, Green Bank Facility and the National Climate Change Fund, something that I think none of us have really focused on, but that is actually implicit in all the models that you've been hearing from today, 
is that green banks provide financing, but they often and almost always need to function across a function adjacent to a grant or incentive function as well. So grants can be used in ways that also reduce risk and leverage the potential for finance, reducing upfront project costs, perhaps reducing the need for excessive collateral, perhaps uh, covering um, project preparation support and technical support. There are different roles for grants in the mix, but in developing countries, the need for grants alongside the financing is essentially a given. So green banks often need to be created alongside either an existing green fund, as is the case with the DBSA and is also being done in Rwanda, or adjacent to a newly created grant facility focused specifically on climate. So moving back up to the top for the green bank facility, which is the credit facility or financing facility, capitalization could come from um, the African Development Bank as an accredited entity alongside loans from the Green Climate Fund um, and co-financed co also through development partners. Those three sources, DFIs, the GCF, and an anchor accredited entity often form the core of green bank capitalization on the credit facility side. On the grant side, the National Climate Change or Green Fund side, those grant funds can come clearly from development partners. There is also a grant component that is possible through the GCF window alongside financing. And those funds are used to leverage projects in the pipeline where the grant funds are used for project preparation and to reduce upfront costs and to make projects overall more, more bankable. Um, and then funneled into eligible green projects and this chart should certainly have a co-finance arrow coming in along this bottom green line, which is the essential piece. That's where you crowd in the private finance. And then you can see in the very bottom of this, the role of the various parties. In this more systemic uh, case, which is also true for an individual country, often the anchor capitalization does involve the GCF because of its concessional nature and flexibility and purpose-driven consistency. So the GCF alongside an accredited entity is a critical role. Um, the local financial institutions and development partners are critical for co-capitalization and grants. National governments play a key role in champion, championing the project, supporting the flow of funds that require uh, a flow through government structures and providing leadership. And lastly, and critically important are commercial banks who provide uh, project level co-finance. And I'm realizing also that project developers should be in this list as well, because they're the ones bringing forward the pipeline of financeable projects. So I think I'll close there and pass it back to Mary and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Andy, Mohammed, and Brian. Um, really insightful presentations. We are going to switch now to a um, panel. Um, one of the things, I'll just summarize some of the things that I have heard from each of you as you were presenting, is that there are different models that can be deployed depending on what is going on in that specific country. All of the models should be market driven or driven by the goals of that country or the jurisdiction. And that it's really important to consider how to leverage that private capital. Um, as Andy mentioned, the need is very urgent and the magnitude of the work that must be done cannot be done without the funding from the private market as well. Um, so I encourage all of you who are listening to, um, if you do have any specific questions, please um, send them in the Q&A. Um, I do believe that the organizers have agreed to share the presentations, so you will hear from the Green Bank Design Summit on where that is, um, where those will be posted. Um, but let me start, Mohammed, with you. 
Um, so let's talk, you talked about the climate finance facility. How is that specifically distinct from the Development Bank of South Africa? And what market barriers can it achieve that the DBSA could not? Thank you so much, Maria. So I think there are a couple of areas where it, it may be distinct. Um, although, as I've mentioned before, you know, we try to uh, kind of um, incorporate it as much as possible to the existing processes. However, there are several areas where it's definitely unique. In, firstly, the product offering, you know, the ability to provide credit enhancement, um, you know, a concessional debt, a subordinated debt. Uh, as a DFI, we and although we're owned by the South African government, we're not reliant on um, the fiscus, you know, for support. We raise, you know, our, our funding from the market. So, you know, our cost of funding is quite expensive. So, what is quite key for us is the ability to attract um, funding from these climate finance mechanisms, such, such as the GCF, and blend that with with uh, with DBSA resources to offer this unique product offering, which the DBSA in its normal course of business would not be in a position to, to, to offer. Um, the second difference, I think, as I mentioned before, is just the size of the projects. Um, you, know, uh, you know, this fund is limited, but we hope you know, with the success and building the track record of this facility at the next phase, we'll be able to capitalize this facility further and be able to support much larger projects. So at the moment, you know, we we're not looking at you know, huge projects. We need to ensure, obviously, a balanced portfolio, both um, geographically as well as from a sector perspective. Um, Sector-wise, there isn't much difference. You know, as I said, the key, the key thing for us was to align it as much as possible to the DBSA mandated sectors. Nonetheless, there, are, there is some nuance. You know, there, there would be certain areas where we would accommodate projects under the CFF, um, um, as long as it's within the broader mandate of, of the DBSA, even though it may not be a key focus area. Um, the waste, for example, you know, uh, waste management is not something that DBSA would typically, you know, fund, but we would look at it from a, from a um, CFF perspective. I think um, what quite importantly, you know, although we rely a lot on uh, existing resources within the DBSA, we try to complement where we can um, to obviously implement such a unique facility. So what we've done, for example, we established a project steering committee, you know, just to evaluate as an extra layer, um, you know, to the existing DBSA process, just to evaluate the climate credentials of each project before it goes through the normal DBSA approval process. And I think that's quite key for a facility that's new to the bank, where we may not have a lot of climate expertise. And um, so we have kind of external um, individuals sitting on that committee just to, 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 um, to have an objective view on the climate uh, um, you know, impact um, of, of these projects. Last but not least, uh, we also have a dedicated team you know, just to look after the facility. I think with the other programs that we have within DBSA, you know, we just use our normal um, structures you know, to, to implement, whereas uh, for the CFF, you know, we needed to ensure that we have a dedicated team just to manage this particular facility, which is partly supported, you know, through a grant from, um, you know, from, from the Green Climate Fund. So in conclusion, uh, I think, Mary, the idea is, you know, although distinct from, from DBSA in a sense, ultimately, we still want to make sure that we meet our objective of using this facility to kind of um, influence the mainstream operations. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mohammed. I um, really like the way that you are leveraging the exper expertise and the lending expertise of the DBSA and that you're able to offer flexibility through the CFF to meet the specific needs of the climate adaptation and mitigation um, goals. So um, really well done. Um, Brian, let me turn it, uh, direct a question to you. You mentioned that the Connecticut General Assembly recently passed the governor's bill to expand your purview beyond clean energy to include environmental infrastructure. Um, so when you think about that, what do you imagine the, green, the Connecticut Green Bank will become in 10 years as a result of that? Wow, and thank you for the question, Mary. It's a great question. I, I think 10 years ago when the legislature created the first state level Green Bank here in the US, I don't think we, they would have imagined what we have become today. So it, all of that is to say that the journey has led us to this moment where 
you know, we have invested $300 million of public resources to attract $1.7 billion of private in our clean energy economy. So we've come a long way. But, you know, if you look at the numbers, you know, the, our predecessor model was really an incentive-based model, a grant model. So, so to something Andy was talking about earlier, the typical way for government to act in a way to try to bring about public policy and to support public policy is to provide grants to the market and incentivize the market. Well, the scale of the problem is so large that government needs to do a better job mobilizing private investment. So, so the Green Bank model is built off, built off of that principle of using a limited amount of public to mobilize more private. Um, there are several studies. Um, there's the Center for American Progress study here in the US that says that um, uh, we need to be investing $200 billion a year year here in the US in energy efficiency and renewable energy to attack climate change. There's a United Nations Environment Program study on sustainability back in 2016 that said over the next 15 years, we need $90 trillion in our global economy to address sustainability. When you start to look at that number on a per capita basis, it's about six to $800 per person per year. Uh, here in Connecticut, the, our predecessor model had $8 per person per year of investment in the green economy. We've taken that an order of magnitude to $80 per person per year. We need to take that another order of magnitude. So, so to give us all a sense of the scale of the climate problem. So with the expansion of our scope, we're really looking at Green Bank 2.0, which is how can we not only continue to accelerate the uh, investment by the private sector in clean energy mitigation, but also now begin to mobilize more investment in adaptation. Um, there are reports out there that break apart investments in adaptation and mitigation, and it, adaptation is way behind. So, you know, I think it's 5% of global climate finance goes into adaptation versus mitigation. So we need to start to be catalysts in terms of driving more private investment in the ways that we become more resilient to the impacts of climate. Because, you know, Connecticut, we, we experience hurricanes, snowstorms, all delivering power outages and, and all the impacts that, that happen as a result of climate. So with the new authority, you know, we have the ability now to support waste, uh, recycling, water, uh, agriculture, land conservation, uh, resiliency and adaptation, uh, parks and recreation. Um, so with our bonding capability, uh, we have the ability to issue bonds. Uh, we expect to um, identify and attract more investment from citizens. Uh, we like to see citizens buy our bonds along with institutional investors so that we can invest in uh, the green economy of Connecticut. Um, so we're going to use that. And uh, working with you, Mary, and uh, Andy, and others uh, to bring about the Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator uh, here in the country, the, the United States, uh, we're looking forward to working with the federal government to mobilize more, to take some of those federal resources on top of our local resources to mobilize more private investment. So, um, you know, that's all to say we've got a lot of planning ahead of us. A lot of envisioning what uh, the future would look like in terms of a decade later in Connecticut. What is it going to look like with the environmental infrastructure element? Uh, I'm excited by that. Our team is excited by that. And uh, the advocates here in the state are excited by the potential of the Green Bank model. So to be continued. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. I can't believe it, but we are up against our time already. All of the presentations have been so insightful. Thank you for the questions in the chat. If any of you have follow-on questions that you would like to ask any of us personally, um, you are welcome to reach out to us. Um, and Carolina, do you have some closing comments? Thank you very much, Brian, Andy, and Mohammed for, for your um, really, really insightful presentations and responses. Thank you very much, Mary, Mohammed, Brian, and Andy for your excellent presentations. Um, and I do, just do reiterate um, uh, Mary's comment about sending in additional questions directly to, to the speakers. Um, it was, I think, a great introduction to examples of different Green Bank models and to some of the issues and considerations that we'll uh, be discussing more fully in some of the deeper dive uh, workshops over the next few days. Um, so I just want to thank the speakers again, as well as our sponsors, the Inter-American Development Bank, Green Bank Network, and Green Climate Fund. 
Uh, and finally, a thank you to our audience for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you uh, in the rest of the, the sessions this week. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, goodbye.